I am a fertility doctor, board certified reproductive endocrinologist, which means I did train first in OBGYN and then specialized in reproductive endocrinology. And basically what I do every day is I make test tube babies. So, and that's where you guys come into play because in order for guys to have a baby, you need, you have the sperm, we need the uterus and we need the egg. So what we're doing is we're getting a uterus, a gestational carrier or gestational surrogate and then we're getting donor eggs and then we're getting your sperm, either both of you separately or together or sequentially and those are all different things that we have to talk about. So the reason, one of the basic reasons why we talk about gestational surrogacy versus traditional surrogacy, gestational surrogacy plus donor eggs plus traditional surrogacy, because that is a huge difference in terms of you guys are trying to have a baby with the two of you that you're going to parent, that you're going to be have custody of, and the you cannot legally have a woman give her egg and carry the baby, and then ask and then uh, enforce any kind of agreement where she basically then she's giving her baby up. So, but if you have a carrier and you have an egg donor and your sperm and you do all the paperwork ahead of time, legal representation, you've done your homework, then you can really truly be legally be the parents of the child. And um, so that's the reason why we do this whole just separate person provides the uterus, separate person provides the egg, and then the sperm. Um, the big trend, well, the big trend these days that's really exciting or, um, in medicine is the new vitrification technology. Have you guys heard about vitrification? Vitrification is this cool new process of freezing, and it's completely and totally revolutionized egg freezing very recently, so much so that egg freezing was, until October 2012, considered by the American Society for Reproductive Medicine to be experimental. And now they've said the vitrification method of freezing has made the num has changed the numbers so much that if you're a good program with experience, your egg frozen egg pregnancy rates can be almost the same as your fresh egg pregnancy rates. And we originally worked in egg freezing. We're very excited because young women that have cancer that were single and we're going through chemotherapy now have a chance to freeze their eggs before chemotherapy and radiation. And, in, and we didn't realize it, but it's started to become really, really helpful in third party reproduction. So in my gay couples that are trying to have a baby, they are coordinating multiple things. And you guys that have been here at this conference, you know that there's a lot of coordination, a lot of logistics involved. There's the two of you, there's your carrier, there's the carrier's husband, there's the donor, potentially the donor's partner as well. You're coordinating a lot of people. Every single person has legal representation, consent forms, testing, medical screening, psychological, all of those kinds of things have to come together. And we found for our gay couples that have, have the most people to coordinate, really, compared to anybody else, that the frozen egg thing has been really, really helpful to us. We have a frozen egg bank and they can just go online and if they like one of the one of the profiles, you can just order the eggs and have them FedExed and they can sit there while you know we evaluate your sperm and you get the carrier evaluated and every the, this is another really common question, which step do I do first? And the honest answer is there's no set protocol because you have so many pieces that you have to put into place. You are kind of like juggling a lot of balls at once. And we prefer that you start everybody on their little pathway. You have a conversation with the lawyer and you start them working on your the legal aspects and the surrogacy agency. But we can be a coordinator. Like we, you know, it, like I, we do think that you know, obviously we have a personal bias, but we do, we also try to feel like if that we, if you stop to the IVF program first and you have an experienced IVF program where you have a whole team of professionals that do this all the time, that we can be kind of your umbrella or your core go-to center where we can say, okay, here's a couple lawyers to talk to, here's an agency to talk to, 
Um, these are your choices of donors. Um, we can try to make it as simple and as one stop as we possibly can, even though we're not lawyers or a surrogacy agency. So, because we've worked with all these people and we kind of know their different personalities, the way they work, and hopefully can coordinate that to you for you, make recommendations and help keep the process coordinated and together. So when you're, when you come back to me and you say, well, our lawyer said this and this and this, what do you think about that? We, you know, we'll have opinions for you. We'll have direction for you. We'll have advice for you about those kinds of things. So no, there's no particular order, but um, we do feel like we can be kind of a central clearinghouse in addition to just, you know, we just, we make, we actually make the baby. So. Um, there's a few, so I want you to know about egg freezing technology. I want you to know about the vitrification because it's not, it's something that's really big in terms of, I don't know if you saw Facebook and Apple now paying for egg freezing for young women as part of their benefits. That's because of vitrification because it's so successful, this technology. And I think it's actually going to be really, really helpful in gay couples with their third party parenting endeavors because it's going to simplify things for you. I have a couple that, uh, needs gestational carrier and needs um, donor egg and they live in China and they travel all over the world all the time and they have a donor that they love that's here in New Jersey and the donor they love has to um, is available now but then will not be available for six months in the first half of 2015 because she has other obligations and they were really really sad that they couldn't use her because they couldn't couldn't get the sperm here in time, you know, for the cycle. But she's, you know, reviewed it with the lab. She's a great donor. We've seen her eggs before. We're going to freeze her eggs. And then they're going to get the donor that they want. And whenever I get the sperm, I'll get the sperm, you know. And then, you know, we'll coordinate everything together. The sperm will be frozen. Frozen or fresh sperm makes no difference for success rates. And then so when we get the carrier, we will thaw the eggs, put it together with the sperm, make the embryos, and put the embryos in. You got a question? Yeah, this question. What is the uh, success rate in frozen eggs versus fresh eggs? Yeah. So with donor in the donor egg population, so that's women 30, 21 to 32 years old who have been screened, who have a normal FSH, normal AMH, anti-malaria <coughs> hormone, it's the same in our program. Now, I will tell you the take-home baby rate, we have like you know, 30 to 40 live births, ongoing pregnancies with frozen eggs and hundreds and hundreds of live births from fresh eggs, but it's the same per single embryo transfer, one nice blastocyst transfer, we're seeing 50 to 60% take home from, you know, the frozen eggs. So we've been incredibly pleased, and that's like a huge change from just a couple of years ago. So it really has completely and totally changed the field and I think it's going to make a huge difference in third-party reproduction and people are not talking about it that much yet because it's just you know it's it's so new so we definitely want you guys um, to know about that then yes can you just add um, our own donors because we have in terms of what we can supply we have own donors frozen egg that what we can give as a center can you share that part oh that we have our fresh donors that we coordinate we have the frozen egg donation, and then we also work with a bunch of donor egg agencies that we've, you know, there are hundreds of donor egg agencies out there. And if a donor egg agency doesn't have experience and doesn't know what they're doing, that you, you can end up spending a lot of money and going through a bunch of donors that can get rejected. So you need a, a donor agencies typically don't do all the medical screening, but if they're experienced and they know what they're doing and they counsel the donors appropriately, then your chance that using that agency that you'll have your donor rejected is very low. Whereas an inexperienced agency, the rejection rate can be quite high. It's like if you just put an ad in the paper, hey, you want $8,000 so you can be my egg donor, you get like a lot of responses because everybody wants $8,000, but nobody really knows about the egg donation part. So you definitely, the experience of the agency when you're, you know, for the, for the donors is, is very, very important. Yes. I have two questions. Yes. One is the surrogates that you, the surrogate carriers that you work with, do yep. they come from New Jersey or are they coming from all over? They're coming from all over. And, so how and it is very. You spend with your you? lawyer needs to help you decide what are the best places your carrier should come from. Because in New Jersey, it used to be that if the baby came out of your vagina, 
that is your baby legally. And it used to be like that in all the states. And now everything is changing, and I'm telling it changes like every week. Just like marriage equality changes every week. You know, it's like, oh, now what's the latest state that um, that they allow, like, you know, that we have uh, gay marriage is legal. And then, oh, next week somebody decided it's not legal. You know, so that is changing. And whether you're single, you have a civil union, whether you're married, do you want a pre-birth order? Do you want a, pre a second parent adoption? Do you want to do both? All of those things play into where should your carrier deliver. And you need a really, you know, really good, savvy so how much lawyer. Does the carrier come, how much does your fertility center? They just provide? email us. That, you know, the carrier monitoring is not so hard. So once the implantation is successful, the pregnancy Yeah, is carrier monitoring is not so hard. So we can monitor. We do, do things by email, and then we bring them in, like, maybe a day before. If everything's, we do bring them here in person for in-person screening. They have to be in here. You guys have to meet them in person. The psychologist wants to meet the carrier and her husband separately, you separately, and then see the, you guys together to make sure like that it's going to go okay. And then she'll do a little bit of medical screening with us. But then after that, everything can be done remotely, and then we and then she can fly in like the day before, do a quick <coughs> scan. She's already on the drugs. We know all her levels. We know what we, you know, you can the digital films that you can see usually are just as good. Um, as everything else. And so, so when it comes to the gestational care, you have health insurance, you haven't had problems with certain states in terms of, because you're building That's another state. thing and that you have problems. to be aware of, and with Obamacare, it is changing all the time, and a lot of these carriers, they are finding every single day new ways to say no, and one of the ways they say no is, oh, she's not keeping the baby, we're not covering her pregnancy. So that's another thing that the lawyers have to help you with, who's who's covering all those medical expenses, what, what's going on with the insurance, and you need, you need to work out the insurance, you have to have a, you know, a surrogacy friendly, um, you know, obstetrician, and, you know, so there are definitely a lot of things to think about. The other technology that I want you guys to be aware of that's really taking off now, not specifically third party, but everybody doing assisted reproduction should know about it, is the genetic testing. So we can, um, Barnabas happens to be one of the world leaders in genetic testing, so I always talk about it, where we can do basically like a mini amniocentesis on the embryo, so we check for Down syndrome, we do check for sex, and a lot of people do ask about sex selection. In general, um, ACOG and ASRM say, you know, we don't really recommend sex selection because we worry about sex bias, we know that gay couples often have a lot of concerns about the sex of the child, and, and those are all things that the psychologist will talk with you about, but it is definitely, that's part of the testing, is when you test uh, embryo genetically, you are checking for the sex as well. So potentially you could choose the sex, but potentially you could harm your cycle if, like, let's say you want a boy and the girl embryo looks much better and is much more likely to make a pregnancy. So those are things you should talk about with your doctor if you want to think about it. And there's a pros and cons. And we're not making that sex. We're making everybody. And then you guys have, if you choose one, that means you're also leaving somebody behind as well. So, you know, stuff that you have to think about. But that technology is there. It's quite accurate. Not quite as accurate as amniocentesis, but it's kind of amazing, like, the kinds of things that we can do these days. You know, so. And so I'm just, um, after the first, after the implantation and pregnancy is going ahead, then basically care is transferred to wherever the station care is. Exactly. Care. So we tend to watch time? over the pregnancy. Even if the pregnancy is remote, the carrier is in another state. Like, we, we do the transfer, we put her in the plane, send her off, and, and it's totally safe to do that. Like, she can get up and, and as long, you know, we just want her to drink lots of water on the plane, but, um, and, and not sit to, next to anyone with Ebola, you know, so. Uh, but she, she can go back and we monitor really carefully remotely for the first four weeks of, uh, from the pregnancy test, and, and if you monitor four weeks, then they're eight weeks pregnant, then they go to the obstetrician. So usually if the carrier's in another state, they're working with an IVF center in that state, and I'm communicating with that IVF center. I want her on estrogen, progesterone, things like that, and they're communicating the lab values and the ultrasound.